So it all makes sense of what the prophet is doing, so uh, you're very welcome. Can you give a go with this? Oh, actually, I'm going to use that when I get that one. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Great. It's good to be with you again. Uh, as David has just said, Emma last week gave the first part of her Word of the Lord for 2019, second part coming next Sunday. And as she said, she was in prophet mode, uh, which she so enjoys. Well, here we play to our strengths and to our giftings as a community. And so I'm in teaching mode this morning with you and teaching the biblical context for the prophetic words that we hear. Uh, if your memory is good, you will remember that Emma's third point was summarized, speak and not be silent. And I quote her now, that 2019 would be a year when the church and the prophets will come into their greatest verbal release. We have for quite a while now, as the church en masse, been in the middle of the story of Jonah, she said, wrestling with our own voice, wrestling with our own call, which is a call on all the church, not just the prophets, to be spokespeople, spokesmen and women for God. And we have ended up stuck in political comment rather than in the truth of God. And the church has become today a place of political opinion rather than divine opinion. So quoting again from Emma, this year we are going to hear strong prophetic words that will include words about the justice and the judgment of God. And some of you, those present, are going to deliver them. Where people of revelation will not hold back truths of sowing and reaping and consequences of national actions as it was in the days of Jonah, where the judgment of God produced God's plan. The strong words of the Lord produced his plan. And the words that some of us will have to speak in 2019 will bring about the holy provocation that nations require today to get back on track. Okay, that was quite strong. And uh, as I heard uh, Emma preach that, uh, my mind went back to the book of Jonah and felt, and as we discussed it during this past week, that it would be really helpful if on my next four Sundays up preaching that I would take each chapter, four chapters in the book of Jonah, and look at them from that sort of perspective. So that's what I'm going to seek to do. You know, the four chapters of Jonah recount two incidents. In chapters one and two, Jonah is given a command from God, but fails to obey it. He's told to go and to take and carry God's message but he doesn't. And in chapters three and four, Jonah uh, is given that command again, and this time he goes and he carries it out. A few other words of introduction over and over again when God comes to people in the Bible and he says to them something like this, and take Moses for an example. Moses, I want you to go and speak this message to, in that case, Pharaoh. And people that God wanted uh, or God wanted people to hear that message and he chose people to carry that message so that they would take that to the right people and we find that in the Bible that people resisted that and I think of all characters in the Bible the patron saint of resistance to carrying the message of God must be the prophet Jonah and one day, the word of the Lord came to him, and God said, would you go to Nineveh to preach? And would you go and preach to those people in Assyria for me? And Jonah said to the Lord, I would not go there in a boat. I would not go there in a float. I would not go there in a gale. I would not go there in a whale. I do not like the people there. If they all died, I would not care. I would not go to that great town. I'd rather choke. I'd rather drown. 
I would not go by land and sea, so stop this talk and let me be. That's the book of Jonah in a nutshell. But uh, (laughs) can I say, be very careful when you come to the book of Jonah. And don't be deceived. The storyline of Jonah, as I've outlined it in that little ditty, couldn't grace it with the word of a poem, I don't think. But um, the outline of the story of Jonah can seduce us into thinking that, well, the book of Jonah is just a sort of simple fable. And as a fable, it has this great fish, and that's the dramatic but implausible high point of the whole story of the book. Just a fable? No. There's a richness in this story and in this book with, in fact, many, many layers of meaning. And I have to share with you this morning, this is my third attempt in my ministry at preaching through the book of Jonah. I remember doing it once to a congregation in Northern Ireland and uh, found that it spoke relevantly in the 70s and 80s, in the 1970s and 80s, to the upheaval that was going on in our community there in that land. And then later I had the opportunity to preach it in a European setting in Spain with a very mixed international congregation uh, on the Costa Brava. And uh, there I found that it awoke in people thoughts that they had never had about relationships, about the word of God, how you speak even to people, how you treat them. And of course, this whole huge, huge issue that Jonah wrestles with is the mercy of God and the complete mystery it was to the prophet at that time. How can God be both merciful and just? Now, if somebody were to ask you this morning, what's the best sermon that has ever been preached? What's the best sermon that has ever been preached? What would you say? Take a moment, turn to the person next to you, and just tell them what you think is the best sermon that has ever been preached. Okay, maybe that floors you a bit. Um, Does anybody have any idea? Anybody want to offer a suggestion? Yes, Mark. Sorry? On the Mount. mount. Okay, I would have to agree with you there. I think the Sermon on the Mount would be my choice for the best sermon that has ever been preached. And uh, that's tremendous, isn't it? I remember once preaching a series in another context on the Sermon on the Mount, and I actually termed it the greatest sermon ever preached. There was one lady in the congregation at that time, and every time I used the phrase, oh, this is the greatest sermon that's ever been preached, she said, I don't like that, Pastor. I wish you would change that and not say that. I don't know what a hang-up was about it, but I think the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 is by far the greatest sermon that there has ever been preached. Okay, another question. What's the worst sermon that has ever been preached? Guys, I hope you've never heard it here. (laughs) As you know, in my past, I've had to uh, lecture to uh, theologues, theologues, theological students who are going into the ministry and learning to preach and having to hear them preach and teach them how to preach and how to hone the gift that God uh, has given them. So in my time, I can assure you I have listened to some pretty awful sermons um, being preached. But the amazing thing is this, I always said to my students that I can forgive you a bad sermon, as long as it's not due to laziness, that you haven't got that done and put in the time and the study and the prayer, I can forgive you a bad sermon as long as you bring to me a sense of the presence of God. Okay, it may not be worth repeating, but as long as you have brought to me a sense of the presence of God, then I have been greatly blessed. Well, I think the prize for probably the worst sermon, we maybe have a clue to who that goes to in the book of Jonah. God calls Jonah to preach in the city of Nineveh. Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. So it wasn't part of Israel. 
So the people that God was telling him to go to didn't know anything about God. They didn't have Bibles. They didn't even have the Ten Commandments. They didn't even know God's name, Yahweh. So this is going to be a really tough assignment to carry God's message to these type of people, to Nineveh. And Jonah is going to have to craft a masterpiece to introduce people who don't know anything about God to God. He's really got to give it all he's got. Now, look at what the Bible says. Jonah, when he arrived in Nineveh eventually, began by going a day's journey into the city, obviously a big uh, city, so he went a day's journey into it, proclaiming, here's the message, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The end. That, to me, is not a sermon. (laughs) There's no introduction. There's nothing practical. There's no application to people. It doesn't even mention the word God. All he was saying, in four days, or in certain days, you will all be toast. That's it. Now, look at the results in the next verse. The Ninevites believed God. The Ninevites repented. The Ninevites changed their lives. Jonah, these people are more ready to hear my message than you are to tell it to them. But I think we can say this, that it is better to have an inadequate message about a glorious God than have a glorious glorious message about an inadequate God. And God is involved whenever we start talking about him and carrying his message to people. Now, with that by way of introduction, let me read to you the first chapter of the book of Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. And such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up! Call on your God! Maybe he will take notice of us! and will not let us perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? Where is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my thought that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, 
and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, go that to that great city of Nineveh. Now you must remember that word great because it comes up again and again and again and again in the book. Go to that great city and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Now, Jonah was a prophet, as we've said. Can I just remind you that he wasn't a priest? Priests served in the temple. They offered sacrifices. They led in the worship of God's people at that time. Priests, a prophet was a different character altogether. Prophet was a reformer, a kind of troubleshooter in people's eyes. They were always picking peoples and pricking people's consciences about their relationship with God. It's very interesting that Israel had a lot of priests, lots and lots of them, so much so that the Bible tells us there were so many that they had to work out rotors as to when they did their duties in, in the temple. They weren't on duty the whole time, there were just too many of them, so it was shared out. But generally speaking, Israel had just one prophet at a time. Seems to me that was all that the nation could stand. One day the word of the Lord came to this prophet, to Jonah. And life is not easy when you are a prophet. Because the word comes to Jonah and says, go to Nineveh. Now you will hear, and I hear sometimes God say to us, do this, do that. Maybe he speaks to it in just three words, as he did to Jonah, go to Nineveh. But you see, Jonah was a prophet of Israel. He had nothing to do with other countries. For crying out loud, I think he was saying to God, why are you sending me there? I am an Israelite. I am a prophet to Israel. And in Nineveh, they didn't have temples. They didn't know anything about sacrifices. They didn't know about the true God. But the word of God came to him and said, Jonah, go to Nineveh and preach. And it's very striking how God expresses this. It's not go to Nineveh and just preach to it. But go to Nineveh and preach against it. Not just go there and preach. But go there and preach against it. A very daunting task. Now Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And in the 7th and 8th centuries BC, Assyria was the great world power. And Assyria chewed up and spit out countries left, right and centre. And it would put the populations of conquered nations, nations that it defeated, and send them on huge death marches. It practiced genocide basically as a policy of the state. Uh, found ample evidence to know that after capturing their enemies, the Assyrians would cut off both legs and one arm of their enemies, leaving the other arm so that they could shake the victim's hand in mocking them as they died. That's something of what the Assyrians were like. And because of that, the Assyrians were so hated. I would term them today a terrorist state. They were a huge country and a huge empire, but nonetheless, they were a terrorist state. Now, I can't begin to talk to you about Jonah without mentioning another prophet, far less well-known than Jonah. Does anybody know who that other prophet is? I used to say to students when I lectured on the minor prophets, you cannot preach to people about Jonah without preaching about this other prophet. Wow. How have you been reading your minor prophets recently? 
Nahum, absolutely, absolutely. And you have to read both of them together because Jonah and Nahum came from the same place. They both had the same sort of message. You see, Jonah was born near Nazareth and he was the local hero of the people of Nazareth. And Jesus, when he was a boy, must have heard Jonah spoken about when he was growing up. Because they all knew that's where Jonah came from. And it's very interesting that Jesus, in his later ministry, only compared himself with one prophet. And that was the prophet Jonah. He only compared himself to one prophet. And it was the prophet Jonah. And they came from the same geographical area. Now, Nahum came from a town northeast of Nazareth called Capernaum. Kappa means simply village. Capernaum, are you beginning to get it? Uh, you may not have realized it before, but Capernaum means village of Nahum which was Jesus' main base for his ministry in the, around the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus had a close connection with these two prophets, Jonah and Nahum. Both prophets were sent by God to the same place, to Assyria. Why did they both go to Nineveh? When? Well... It, they went 150 years apart. Jonah was the first prophet to go and challenge Assyria, and Nahum was the last. And they both went because of the sheer wickedness of the Assyrian nation and the Assyrian people. Nahum, and you can read it when you get home this afternoon, says this, Woe to Nineveh! Woe to that city of blood! That is what it was called, a city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims, piles of dead, bodies without number, people stumbling over corpses. Your injury is fatal. Now, the prophet Zephaniah also spoke about Nineveh. But it was Nahum who said in 620 BC, Assyria, you are finished and you will be wiped out. And Nahum predicted the fall of Nineveh and said, when you are destroyed, people are going to go out into the streets and just clap their hands. They are going to stand and applaud when you fall because of your endless cruelty to others. And sure enough, in 612 BC, Nineveh fell, and the whole of the Assyrian Empire followed six years later in 607 BC. Now, Nineveh didn't fall after Jonah's visit, but it did 150 years later after Nahum's visit. And that was a problem for Jonah. And we'll look at that and unpack that later on. Now, if you want to understand how an Israelite felt about Nineveh, when I think in our modern context, we would need to think of Al-Qaeda, of ISIS, of living in Berlin in Nazi Germany in the 1930s and 40s. We need to think of a power that killed your children, that embraced or enslaved your brothers that brutalized and abused the women in your family. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah and said, go to Nineveh. Learn to speak Assyrian Nathan, uh, Nineveh, so that they, uh, Nathan, uh, Jonah, so that they understand what you're saying and face them with my coming judgment. And Jonah's reaction was, God, <clears throat> couldn't you just send them a text message? Couldn't you just send them an email? Couldn't you just put something on social media? The word of the Lord came to Jonah, go to Nineveh. How did that word come? Was it a, a word spoken in a burning bush? 
Was it a still, small voice? Was it an angel? Was it a vision that Jonah had while he was awake? Was it a dream that he had when he was asleep? Was there any room for doubt? Was he, that he had he heard God correctly? The text doesn't say. Did people around Jonah know that he had heard from God? Was there, in fact, a Mrs. Jonah? Was he married? Who he had to go and tell and say to his wife, God has told me to go to Assyria and condemn them face to face. And did she reply, husband, you've got to be crazy. Go back and make sure you've heard correctly from God. All the text says is the word of the Lord came to Jonah, go to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was not in Jonah's comfort zone by any means. Nineveh is the place God calls you to, which you don't want to go to. Nineveh is trouble. Nineveh is danger. Nineveh is fear. What do you say when God says, go to Nineveh? Go to that place you don't want to go to. Because sometimes God will say that. And Jonah, carry a message, my message, and it's not a message that you want to carry. It's not even a message you want to bring to a people like the Assyrians. So what does Jonah do in response to this commission from God? Well, he leaves home, but of course he doesn't leave for Nineveh. He heads for Tarshish. And as you probably know, Tarshish is in the, is in the absolute opposite direction. Verse 2 says, Jonah ran away from the Lord and he headed for Tarshish. Jonah the prophet, the man of God, running away from God. What a stupid thing to do. Would you ever think and try and run away from God See, one of the things about disobedience in the Christian life and the sin that it is requires the illusion that I can get away from God. That I can so dull my conscience and my thinking processes that I can blot God out of my mind. And if I want to disobey God, one of the first things I have to do is to make sure my mind does not think about what God has told me to do. So I set up a sort of mechanism in my mind and in my thought processes that says that I can get away from God. I have to find a way mentally to achieve that, to eliminate in my thinking the awareness of God's presence, the awareness of God's character, the awareness of God's will, and the awareness of God's holiness. That's what sin is all about. And because I am still struggling with sin, as Jonah was, he built up that sort of mechanism in his thinking and eliminated an awareness of God. And in some senses, we've all done that to some extent or other, haven't we? Because we wanted to do something and we know that maybe it was wrong and God was not in it and God hadn't sanctioned it and God hadn't commissioned it. Whatever it was or whatever it concerned or whoever it concerned, But we said, no, we didn't want to do that. And so we wanted to eliminate God out of our minds. So Jonah manages to an extent to do that. Uh, And he went off in this boat. Now you notice that when he went down to Joppa, the text says very interestingly that he paid the fare and he went on board to try and run away from the Lord. Now, a little detail here, the text says he paid the fare. Now, whoa, you you think that's a normal thing, but it wasn't a normal thing in those days. In the ancient world of those days, money was still relatively new. It had been a barter economy. 
and money was tremendously scarce amongst the people of Israel. They would have done all their business commercially, economically by bartering. You know, you give me that, I'll give you something else in return. Hardly anyone would have been able to do what Jonah did here and pay for his fare to cross the Mediterranean. But Jonah had enough money to buy a passage for what was considered in those days a very long voyage. And because he had money, he had mobility and he had options. And money today brings you and me mobility and options. And we're told that he jumped on this ship for Tarshish. Now, uh, I'm not just giving you these details just as random geographical information, because Tarshish is significant, not only just because it was in the opposite direction from Nineveh, but because in many ways it was the opposite kind of city to Nineveh. Nineveh was a military city. You pick that up from the uh, uh, prophet Nahum. Tarshish was not a military city. Tarshish was a city of great wealth. It was a pioneer in trade in the Mediterranean at that time. And commerce overseas and trade overseas was, in Jonah's day, the new technology. And it was making some people very, very rich. And development of trade is not necessarily bad but it has a way of leading to greed, and as David has said earlier, to arrogance in people and in nations and to national pride. So that the phrase, this phrase in the text here, a ship to Tarshish, became a well-known phrase, and it became a symbol of the wealth of the ancient world. And that phrase, a ship to Tarshish, comes up a number of times in the rest of the Old Testament. Listen to this passage from Isaiah. The Lord has a day in store for all the proud and lofty, for all that is exalted, for every ship of Tarshish. The arrogance of man will be brought low. Isaiah comes again in the prophet Ezekiel. The ships of Tarshish will... Uh, serve as carriers of your wealth. With your great wealth and your wares, you enrich the kings of the earth. Now you are scattered by the seas. So the ships of Tarshish reveal that there were symbols of wealth and self-sufficiency and power and greed that individuals were experiencing and that nations were beginning to experience. I wonder whether haven't we been there before? And do we ever learn from history? And because we never seem to learn from history, then we're condemned to repeat it. So Jonah runs away and he heads to get away from God's purposes. And then we read very briefly, and I need to speed up here. Um, he thinks, I think, that he will be safe over there in Tarshish. I want to say to you this morning that Nineveh was the only safe place for Jonah to be. Have you got it? Because that was God's will. And you are your safest. That doesn't mean your life isn't vulnerable in that position. That doesn't even mean that you don't sometimes lose your life in your commitment and following of the Lord Jesus Christ. But being in the centre of God's will is the safest place for you and me to be. But the Lord sent a violent wind on the sea and such a violent storm in verse 4, it says there. Uh, and the word translated, I think in some versions, is correctly translated, great. Great storm came. Now, God is beginning to do great things. So he sends a great wind and he sends a great storm. And the ship threatens to break up and all the sailors are afraid. And each of them starts crying out to their own gods. They throw their cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. Wow, they must have been desperate. All their investment, all their money was in their cargo. You only normally in those days had one bite of a cherry like this. 
of being able to trade cargo across the Mediterranean Sea at that time and get a huge whacking, whacking pro, uh, uh, benefit uh, and profit at the end of it. So maybe many of the, the sailors had invested all the money that they had in getting this cargo across to the other side of the Mediterranean. Now, lifespan in those days was very short as well. So you didn't have often second chances at these things. But they were throwing, in throwing all that cargo into the sea, they were throwing all their hopes into the sea as well. That's how bad the storm was. Did you notice in the text it says, each is praying to who? To his own gods. Now, outside of Israel, the ancient world did not generally have the idea of monotheism, that there's one great God. They thought in those days of little tribal gods, uh, little ethnic groups that they had, tribal groups, and there was a little God assigned to each of those little ethnic groups. Uh, isn't it? It's kind of ironic that we sometimes think today that we invented the whole concept of multiculturalism. How prior, proud we can get, isn't it? There was multiculturalism in the days of Jonah. It's not something new uh, on our map. Each one prayed to their own God. And when the sea is calm, well, it didn't really matter what God you prayed to, um, but you may have just put a nod in the divine's direction so that everything would go okay with you. But when there's a storm that you can't handle, then you really start to cry out. Now, remember what Jonah was doing at this point. He's sleeping in the bottom of the boat. And the captain is stunned by this. He says, Jonah, how can you sleep? What are you thinking? Get up, wake up, call on your God. Maybe he will take notice. Maybe he will end uh, this storm. Now, notice, this is a pagan Gentile ship's captain calling the man of God, the prophet of God, to start praying. Really, it should have been the other way around, shouldn't it? The pagan is doing what prophets do, calling the man of God to pray. And the prophet is doing what the pagans do, sleeping when he should be praying. So it's all the wrong way around here. So God is up to something in this book. And it's really interesting that Jonah does nothing at this point. He just doesn't seem interested, does he? He has so shut down what God had said to him. But they seem to indicate as they cast their lots, which was the usual thing that they did in those days, to find where the problem was, and the problem was with Jonah. That could have been throwing dice, that could have been picking straws. But Jonah was established to be the, the, pro the problem. And they ask him in verse 8, what's your story? And Jonah says, I'm a Hebrew, I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the earth. And this terrifies them. And we read, and the people feared, what? A great fear. That word great again. The people feared a great fear. They had a big fear. And they asked him what he had done, and he had told them before that he was running from God. And so the sailors had been praying to a bunch of tribal gods, each of their O Elohim. That's the genetic, generic Hebrew term for God, the God of Israel, or it's also used in Hebrew, just the plural word for gods. So our Bible opens, in the beginning, God, or in the, Bible, in the beginning, Elohim, created plural gods there in the first verse of our bible so jonah says to them that he has been running from the god of moses and abraham the god of the old testament the god who these people knew practically nothing about he recognized that Assyrians had their own God and Tarshish had their own God and Israel had their own God. But they figured, these sailors, that, well, OK, he's running away from his own God. But the experience they had in the storm changed all that. 
this is the God, they realized, who was sending this storm, even though they were far, far away from the land of Israel. That's an important thing because they recognized that God were only had rule and authority over a certain geographical period uh, of land. But here, this God that Jonah worshipped, he ruled even over the seas and over the weather. Now, Jonah has come to them, you know, almost if he had come to them in a spirit of pride, I don't think they would have listened to him, or ethnic tribal superiority. But Jonah comes to them not really saying anything about God, but as someone who has messed up and made a mistake. And Jonah's failure is that God uses his failure to bring these sailors to faith. Amazing, isn't it? It, it, it really is amazing. Uh, and the sovereignty of God, you wait until we come come on to the big fish and the big whale. You see the sovereignty of God there. You know, you think God's sovereign on, 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 on a big fish and sea? Why, you go into the next chapter and you see God's sovereign over a little worm that came along and bit into the shrub that Jonah was, was sheltering under and really got Jonah's goat going because he lost his shade and his umbrella in the heat of the sun there. And the miracles, the creative miracles of God here, not only just with the big fish, but also with the little worm, you see uh, the power of God. But the sea gets rougher and rougher, and Jonah says, look, just pick me up, throw me overboard. And then they don't want to do that, and they work even greater and make more effort to try and bring the boat to the shore, uh, and they don't want to put an innocent man to death. But they throw him over. Now, then uh, Jonah starts to pray. But I think I need to say something here before we go any further, and that is to say something about storms in life. Because maybe you're having a storm that you're facing now in your life. It can be a personal health storm, it can be anything, but it's a storm. And let me say just very briefly four things about storms when they come in our lives. Number one, the Bible does not say that every difficulty that you and I face is the result of sin. Now, follow me carefully here. The Bible does not say that every difficulty that we face is the result of sin. But it does teach that every sin will bring you into difficulty. Okay? Your storm is not necessarily the result of sin, but every sin will bring you into difficulty. And all sin has a storm attached to it, ultimately. All sin has a storm attached to it, ultimately. Secondly, as we think about storms, a lot of storms of our lives that come to us are not as the consequences of a particular sin, but as the unavoidable consequence of living in a fallen and a troubled world. You get that point? A lot of our trouble is unavoidable because we live in a fallen and a troubled world. And our fallen world is full of destructive storms. And we do not avoid them breaking over us and our lives and our families at times. Now, we know that when storms come into our lives as believers, whether they're as a consequence of wrong that we've done or whether they're not, we have the promise as Christians that God will use those storms for our good. Romans 8, 28. God makes that promise there. That's tremendous. Let me say another thing about these storms. Storms, thirdly, can wake us up to truths that we would not otherwise see. 
You see, storms develop faith. Storms develop in a sometimes self-control. Storms develop hope. Storms develop love. Storms develop patience. Storms develop humility in us. And storms can wake us up to certain truths that we really wouldn't see apart from the storm. Now, the first opening chapters of the book of Genesis, they teach us that God did not create the world and the human race for suffering, for disease, for natural disasters, for the aging process. For death, God didn't create us for any of those things whatsoever. Evil entered the world when our forefathers turned away from God and set in motion those sorts of things. Now God, and hear me so clearly on this please, God has tied his heart to us. Do you realize this? God has tied his heart to us so that when he sees the sin and the suffering in the world, his heart feels the pain that we feel. And there's that tremendous verse in Isaiah 63, verse 9. In all our afflictions, in all our storms, he too is afflicted. We have a God who has tied his heart, his emotional life, to us. And he feels what we feel. He is not the absent God to our storms and our difficulties. And then lastly on storms, it is not usually clear, I found, until years and years later, if we ever understand this in this life, what God was accomplishing in the difficulties and the storms and the suffering that we went through in life. Don't think you're going to have an easy answer for that in this life. You are not going to have it. You may have no answer for your storm and what God was accompanying through that in your life. You know, when you get to heaven, you probably won't be worried about it. But uh, if we've got any residue of the minds that God has given us here, I think one day we would like to have a conversation uh, uh, and know what God, what were you doing through that? But don't think you will always know. Even though you may follow James chapter 1 diligently, if any man or woman lacks wisdom, let him ask from God. And you know and I know that in the context of the opening verses of James 1, that's in the context of God's wisdom. And living wisely. And so you ask God for wisdom to understand your trial. And that's right, that's biblical. But there are some storms of life you will never see or comprehend the reason why God has sent that and that's been part of what you have experienced. So he goes through this awful time and then you know what happens. He is thrown over the side of the boat. Now please don't think of the next bit of film as being a fish, as you see in children's storybooks, Bible storybooks, with its mouth wide open like this, and uh, here the sailors, as it were, just going to throw the man into the mouth of this big fish. I don't think the Hebrew text allows us to think like that. Jonah was thrown into the sea, and he drowned. I know we debate as scholars as to whether a live Jonah was picked up by the fish or whether a dead Jonah was picked up by the fish. Come back next time and I'll tell you what one I go for. (laughs) Because it really is a very fascinating story. And in chapter 2, Jonah starts to pray, but you ask yourself, where is he praying from? Where is he? Where is he? Is he in the fish? Is he alive in this fish? 
or is in fact he praying from Hades, the place of the departed spirits? Okay, we've got lots to find out in, uh, in, in, in our next study as well. But just to rehash, if you're running from God this morning, stop it, please. It's just a waste of your time. It really is. You will find your greatest security in doing what God has told you to do and being where you know you ought to be in his will. And can I say, is God calling you to your Nineveh? Please don't think that always in the Christian life you're going to be doing something you delight in. A lot of the time you are. The Bible says delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. What happens if he changes your desires of your heart? Because you're delighting in him. And you begin to think, well, maybe God is saying something else to us. And I wouldn't choose maybe this. And yet I know that God is in it. And God will give the grace to walk in it. And to be a carrier of his message there. That's the important thing, isn't it? That is an important thing. And even God overruled Jonah's disobedience for the conversion of these other sailors. You know? Wow. That God can even do that through our failure and our disobedience at times. We have a tremendously feeling God, but we have an also a great sovereign God who does his will in our lives and wants his name glorified and praised and wants all men and women, whoever they are and wherever they live, to hear of his grace and his mercy and find forgiveness in him. And of course, Jonah, he believed, you know, that God, you punish the bad people and the Ninevites are bad. Just give them more stick. <laughs> and God, you reward the good. That's me and my fellow countrymen, the Jews. You know, you send more blessing our way, God, you know. And you deal with those who are unholy and unrighteous. So we have a lot to learn. And can I also say that as we go through the book of Jonah, there is one parable which should be ringing in your minds that Jesus taught, a very famous parable, which is tied in, I believe, with the book of Jonah. And that is the parable found in Luke 15 of what we know as the parable of the prodigal son. And you think through that parable this week and you put Jonah into that parable, okay? And what was Jonah? Jonah, in chapters 1 and 2 of his prophecy, was like the younger son. He ran away from the father. Exactly like wanted his own way. Ran away from the father. In chapters 3 and 4 of Jonah, we find that Jonah there, like the elder brother, you know, God... I didn't want to come to Nineveh to preach to it because I knew you were going to be a forgiving God. And if I went and preached to them, you were going to forgive these people and they ought not to be forgiven. They have done the most outlandish things in the world. And God, they need punishing, not forgiving. And you know, Jonah was just like the older brother in that parable. So have a read of that and the rest of the book of Jonah. Because God is going to delve very deeply into our attitudes of, of heart. And if you read the book of the Nuremberg Trials, particularly um, the, the accounts well worth getting hold of, um, particularly the account of the chaplains at the Nuremberg Trials and how many of the Nazi leaders made a profession of faith and I'll tell you about it uh, uh, when, when we get there in, 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 in a sermon later on. 
But can you imagine, particularly if you're around about my age and a bit older, when you get to heaven and here's your room and next door you find in the person who's got the room next to you is one of the leaders of Nazi Germany in the Second World War who was responsible for the extermination of six million Jews. There is something absolutely amazing about the grace of God. And I can tell you, it is amazing. It is amazing. And sometimes we fall into the category of Jonah and say, God, judge them. Just judge them. And yet God says, no, I want them to know my grace and my forgiveness. I want them in heaven because he's that kind of God. But he does send them the message of judgment. And dear old Nahum told them, oh, you repented 150 years ago, but you've gone back. You slipped back. And God will now fulfill what he said originally to you. And he'll come and judge you. And he did. Father, thank you for your word. Help us to understand it more deeply. Help us to wrestle with it. Help us to be those who hear your voice and hear it clearly and have obedient hearts, whatever you call us to do. And in this area of speaking truth, we pray that we may excel as your people, speaking the truth in love to each other and on the wider level. And Father, we pray that we might understand your character better. It's so easy to be judgmental. It's so easy to feel that if these people were not around, then our community would be a better place. And if these people didn't live next door to me or at the end of my garden, uh, and oh, the sort of things that we have in our community, in our world community today, that judges, Father, forgive us. Forgive us. May we see people as you see them. May we feel for their lostness as you feel for them. May we wonder at the forgiveness of your grace in our lives and why it ever reached us and touched us and changed us, why we ever became recipients of such grace when we deserve the very opposite. And how we should rejoice when others who, to our estimation have lived awful lives when they experience the grace of God we should rejoice with them that they become fellow heirs with us of all that you have planned for your children oh father we need to learn lessons afresh we need to walk humbly with you in these days and our world so needs to hear your message at this time and then lastly father we pray for those amongst us who feel that they're going through stormy times lord we reach out lovingly to them as our brothers and sisters in christ lord will you bless them will you encourage them may they know that you are with them in the storm that often in those circumstances of life when we think you are most absent, in fact, God, you are more present than ever. Oh, Father, may they know, even today, your affirming, loving touch upon them. And if the way doesn't ahead doesn't look clear and it looks uncertain, oh, Father, Grab hold of their hand. And even though they may not have much grip to hold on to you, you have the everlasting grip that will hold on to them and will carry them through. Father, bless them, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, John.